तव गृद तत्वजीवन पविभिरीटिक कर्मशाप श्रवणमंगल श्रीमता तद भुवि गृणंकी भूरीता जना Interestingly, in the Gospel, Sri Ramakrishna discusses some of the very common problems that all of us encounter in our spiritual life. <coughs> What page is that for me? Uh, well, this page, hundred uh, and seven. Well, I am reading from 106th, the last paragraph. Certain problems that we all encounter. See, faith in God, our own efforts, God's grace. What's the role of human effort, self-effort in spiritual life? And in what way is it related to faith? and if self effort has an important role to play in spiritual life then what is what is the relevance of god's grace apparently there is a contradiction if everything is god's grace then human effort doesn't have a very important role to play if human effort is everything then god's grace doesn't have a very important role so all these problems are discussed in a very rational and very harmonious way in the gospel <clears throat> here sri ramakrishna says one must have faith and love let me tell you how powerful faith is a man was about to cross the sea from ceylon to india sri lanka to india vibhishana said to him vibhishana was a great devotee of rama <clears throat> a man of strong faith tie this thing in a corner of your woven clothes mm-hmm. and you will cross the sea safely you will be able to walk on the water but be sure not to examine it or you will sink the man was walking easily on the water of the sea such is the strength of faith when having gone part of the way he thought well, what is this wonderful thing that the vision has given me that i can walk even on the water he untied the note and found only leaf with the name of rama written on it or just this he thought and instantly he sank now what is the psychological mechanism of faith faith strengthens our mind it intensifies our determination it removes all obstacles and doubts so long as we have doubts we will have wavering conflicts and so long as we have conflicts we won't be able to focus on the central idea now what happens when we have when we put a strong faith on something we don't think anything else our whole concentration mind is focused on what we have faith in what we believe in otherwise mind will be full of waverings and conflicts conflicts means contradictory thought currents is this true or is this untrue is the right path or is the wrong path so long as mind is divided into these conflicting thought currents mind won't be able to concentrate and doubts will start emerging in the mind and so long as there are doubts mind will remain weak we won't be able to concentrate one day we may vigorously practice japa meditation reading contemplation next day well after all 
is this going to work? The moment this doubt emerges in the mind, then concentration level is lowered, enthusiasm goes away. We are not able to focus on the central idea. So that's why sometimes people use the word blind faith. You know, I say there could be a faith with open eyes. Faith is always blind. Well, you see, I should give an example. We all know that it is 10 o'clock now. Well, and there is no doubt about it. Do we believe in God with the same intensity and uh, feeling of, and feeling of reality that God exists? We know, we have no doubt that it's ten o'clock now. But when we also believe that God exists, the two beliefs belong to two different categories. We believe God exists, but that belief is qualitatively different from the belief that it is ten o'clock now. It is daytime. Today is Tuesday. Sorry, today is Monday, of course. Today is Monday. <laughs> today is Monday. We have no doubt about it. And it is 10 o'clock now. It's daytime. Nobody doubts this. No wavering, no conflict. But when we believe that God exists, we don't have that kind of faith in the existence of God. So there is a qualitative difference. But... A person with strong faith will, will not have any conflicts. So, it is, is it blind faith to believe that it is 10 o'clock now, it is Monday? <laughs> it is not blind faith. It is real faith. It is blind, in fact. In fact. There is no need of any speculation or discussion on this subject. So, every faith is blind because it's, it is so obvious. There is a famous statement in Shankaracharya's commentary, you know. When do we negate something? When do we affirm something? If something is very obvious, we do not negate it. We don't say it is not Monday today. And we do not say it is Monday today because it is very obvious. Whatever is very obvious, clear to everyone, we don't take the trouble. There is no need to affirm it. And of course we cannot negate it, to be against truth. And whatever is not real, we cannot affirm it. And we don't take the trouble to negate it. It is not night now, it is not dark now. Nobody says that. It is so obvious that it is not dark now. And we don't say it is daytime because it is so obvious. So, prasaktasya ka prastavaha Prasattasya konishetaka. Aprasattasya ka prastavaka. Aprasattasya konishetaka. Shankaracharya states, makes a statement. Whatever is obvious, we do not either deny or affirm. Whatever is absolutely unreal, obviously unreal, we do not negate because we cannot. We do not affirm because whatever is not obvious, there is no need to negate it and we, it is impossible to affirm it. Mm. Similarly, mm. if it is real faith, then it is not a faith, it is a matter of experience, it is a matter of reality. So when we normally say, well, I believe in God, it is not exactly real belief, it is only an attempt to believe in God. We normally say, well, I believe in God. Real belief comes when God becomes a matter of experience in our life. But Sri Ramakrishna says, everyone should try to have the strong, real faith. When we say God exists, that belief should be the same belief which we have when we say it is Monday today. It is so very obvious. Nobody can contradict it. It, is, it should not be an attempt to believe. It should be real belief. So Sri Ramakrishna says, if that real belief is there, then that belief becomes faith. And that faith becomes a strong anchor, a strong help for us to practice spiritual sadhana, to do spiritual practices 
and move towards higher spiritual experiences. So that's what the moment that faith weakens, then we we'll lose our enthusiasm in spiritual practice. We may become even lethargic. We may become la lazy. We may our intensity of spiritual practices may go down. Here comes the in, the importance of self effort. Faith is related to self effort. When we have strong faith, we make our own effort. Now, what is the importance of self-effort in religious life, spiritual life? And what's the importance of God's grace? If you, if you believe that everything comes from God, we have nothing to do, then we do not become fit for God's grace. Even to attain grace worthiness, even to make proper use of God's grace, even to recognize God's grace as God's grace, we must make our mind ready. And when we become ready for God's grace, we become fit for God's grace. It's called God is a grace worthiness, fitness to enjoy and understand. God's grace. Sri Ramakrishna gives a number of examples. One example that he gives is this. Suppose you want to cross the river. Uh, you, you should make use of a ferry, a boat. The boat is now tied to an anchor on the bank of the river. You should untie the anchor and you should start slowly moving towards the midstream. All this involves a lot of effort. First of all, you must give up your laziness, lethargy. You must be enthusiastic. You must be able to put up your own effort. All, all these are involved in getting up from where you are sitting, untying the anchor and slowly uh, moving towards the midstream. Till you reach the middle of the river, the wind that is blowing will not be of any use to you. You will be able to make use of the wind that is blowing only when you reach midstream. If you just, uh, just uh, remain seated on the bank of the river with the boat tied to the anchor and say, I want to cross the river, you won't be able to cross the river. So the first, if, first part is to give up laziness and then to take a strong determination, strong will, and then slowly work our way forward, slowly moving towards the mid middle of the river. And then you find the wind is blowing, that wind becomes a help for you to reach your destination, that the bank of the river. Now wind is like God's grace, but once you start moving with the help of the wind moving forward faster and faster, you understand without, without God's grace, you would not have been able to give up laziness, get up from where you are sitting, untie the anchor and the boat from the anchor and move towards the mainstream. So self-effort also is <coughs> recognized to be part of God's grace once you start moving in the boat, not, but not before that. That's why it is called self-effort is necessary to make proper use of God's grace. If God appears before us right now, we may mistake him as somebody who has come to Lake Tahoe to attend a retreat. But those who have done a lot of spiritual practices those who have reached such a high level of spiritual enlightenment may, may be able to recognize God to be God. An example, I have, repeat, I have said this on an earlier occasion. I am repeating this because it is such a wonderful, absolutely unrivaled imagery that you find in the writings of uh, St. Teresa of Avila. A similar example you find in Philokalia. But in the, in the second volume of the complete, uh, the 
I mean, the complete works of Saint Teresa of Avila, you find. She gives the example of a farmer uh, who wants to irrigate the field. The field is now full of pebbles, stones, weeds and grass. He wants to irrigate the field. Now there are many ways of irrigating the field. There is a river nearby. He, he, he can cut a canal and bring water from the river. There's a well he can make use of buckets or water mill, maybe in those days. There are different ways of bringing water from a pond or a river or a <coughs> lake or a well, whatever may be the source of water. But all involve human effort, self-effort. Now, suppose it starts raining before the field is ready. When the field is full of pebbles, stones, weeds and grass and it starts raining very heavily, that rain won't help the farmer because more than the grains, he has not sowed seed. All these weeds and grass will grow. It won't be of any use to him. So before it starts raining, he should make the field ready. He should remove the weeds, grass and so on, pebbles, stones and so on. Then if it starts raining, he will have a wonderful crop. Otherwise, whatever effort he may put up, it won't be of much use. So, even to enjoy, to make proper use of God's grace, human effort is necessary. And human effort is not possible without faith. Without faith in self-effort. So, first we must have faith in God and then we must make our own effort. <coughs> This country, often these people will sometimes tell, tell you, well, whatever you do, God alone can do everything. It doesn't mean that there is nothing for us to do then. Because there is a great self-deception involved in this argument. If everything is God's grace, then we have nothing to do, we have no role to play. There is a great uh, spiritual uh, self-deception involved in this theory. Self-effort is a very important place because self if without self-effort we don't attain the spiritual fitness to enjoy God's grace. And in Vedantic tradition there are four ways of attaining the spiritual fitness. The first step is we must first of all realize what is real, what is unreal what is absolutely relevant and what is absolutely irrelevant in spiritual life. A kind of priority, setting a priority. Mm. So, if that's why Sri Ramakrishna made a very important point yesterday. Death becomes a wise teacher of the absolute reality because death teaches us one important lesson. That is, this body, all this material comforts, everything will come to an end one day. Second lesson is, when the body perishes, an imperishable reality, the Atman, continues to exist. In that case, life becomes an intelligent preparation for this creative crisis, which is certainly not a fearful, scary episode, but just a transition point. So, Sri Ramakrishna says, every effort, every aspect of human life can be intelligently designed and executed once we understand the imperishable nature of our true reality, our true personality, that is Atman, and the perishable nature of everything else. Sri Ramakrishna gives and several other examples. But one very striking ex example is found in the life of one of Sri Ramakrishna's prominent disciples. His name was Swami Brahmanandaji Maharaj, Sakhan Maharaj. He was an extremely uh, gifted spiritual aspirant. He was a realized soul. But even after uh, so many years of spiritual practices, 
he continued his spiritual sadhana, spiritual practices. So once somebody asked him, you are you, you are given everything by Sri Ramakrishna, your guru, your years of your realized soul. So why should you continue making this uh, strenuous effort to practice spiritual sadhana, spiritual practices? Sida, then his reply was, Sri Ramakrishna, Guru Maharaj had given me everything, but what I have got, I should be able to receive. I should make it my own. Whatever we are given doesn't necessarily become ours. What we earn alone become ours. We will we'll be able to make use of only what we earn, not what we are given necessarily. Often what we are given will be of no use to us unless we become fit to deserve it. That's why even such a great realized soul like Swami Brahmananda Ji himself was showing this example before everybody. Even after reaching such an exalted state of spiritual enlightenment, he continued doing his spiritual sadhana. This is a very important point. So we have to remember first, faith enables us to focus all our energy resources on one point driving away all doubts and waverings and conflicts. Conflicts, doubts and waverings blunt our focus, our concentration and may, may reduce our enthusiasm. Whenever doubt arises, suddenly we become depressed. And at least temporarily we become less and less interested. Well, what's the use of it? At least for some days. Again, we need another blow from some source to turn back to spirituality. So we should not wait till we get a blow to be forced to turn to spiritual life. It is very unwise on our part. Often people need blows, tragedies, tragic events. See that we, we already read about Mahendra Gupta. Such a great spiritually elevated soul he needed a terrible tragedy in his life, which not that uh, it, were, it was the thing that took him to, to a spiritual life, but it so happened incidentally that a domestic tragedy made him turn to his guru, uh, turned him to spiritual life. But it, it, we should not wait for blows to turn to spiritual life. So that's why strong faith is always necessary. Faith is not opposed to reason. There is always a feeling mm -hmm. among many modern academic philosophers that faith and reason are two contradictory ideas. It is absolutely wrong. Mm -hmm. Faith is not irrational. Faith is not opposed to reason. Faith is not superstition. Faith is actually very creative, constructive, formulation of our energy, psychological, mental energy resources uh, and, channel, and a way of channelization of these energy resources towards a creative, constructive ideal, spiritual ideal. You find behind every great spiritual person through, through a strong faith. So there's a very important point that Sri Ramakrishna makes here. Sometimes this this contradiction is discussed in many books. Free will. See what's a is free will very important in spiritual life? He can faith and free will coexist. In fact, free will is very rational. Free will also is not opposed to faith. We have free will, but every intelligent thinking person can understand that whatever may be our effort, there is always an unknown factor in life. I would say, in mathematics, 2 plus 2 is 4, but not in life. The mathematical logic doesn't operate in the context of real life situations. See, can we sure, can we be sure as to how our own mind is going to function next day, 
next moment. A machine, we can be very sure how the machine is going to work. Because an intelligence is artificially programmed in the machine. The machine doesn't have its own intelligence. It has to borrow intelligence from another source. Mm -hmm. But human beings can function more or less independently. But we can never be sure as to how our own mind is going to function. In human life, you find you work very hard with great sincerity, great enthusiasm. Another person works not with so much of sincerity. But the latter one succeeds and you may, may not fully succeed. Now, if you apply mathematical logic or scientific logic, it cannot be so. 2 plus 2 cannot be anything other than 4. But in life, the same effort same sincerity doesn't always produce expected results. We bring up, people bring up children with great enthusiasm, love and affection. They turn against them. You, people, you may help your friend and your help, friend may become ungrateful to you. He may forget whatever help he has received from you. Logic doesn't apply here. If, if you go by logic, but when you do something good for another person, that person should not at least be ungrateful to you. But that happens in life. Mm -hmm. So where do, how would you find logic? That's why I said mathematical logic doesn't operate in the context of human life. Therefore, in human life, free, even free will has a limitation. There is an unknown factor which monotheist, monotheist call God's will, Vedantins or Advedins call Maya, the indescribable, the inexplicable, the mysterious relativity within which human life operates. But Sri Ramakrishna makes one point very clear, a strong faith which helps us to become, to, uh, to, uh, to practice strong determination will remove most of these obstacles and will help us to move forward and become fit for God's grace. So God's grace and self-effort are not mutually contradictory. When we really reach the middle of the stream, we understand even the human effort involved in untying the boat and rowing towards the midstream was also by the grace of God. So self-effort is also involved in the grace of God. That is Sri Ramakrishna's theory. So we will discuss this point maybe in uh, uh, during the interaction. <coughs> Here there is another very interesting discussion. It comes 680, the page 680 is a dialogue, a conversation between Girish and Draghosh and Sri Ramakrishna. <coughs> Here Sri Ramakrishna tells Girish and Draghosh, one can realize God through intense renunciation, but the soul must be restless for him, as restless as one feels for a breath of air when one's head is pressed underwater. So intensity of spiritual search, yearning, that again is reinforced by strong faith. Without strong faith, we cannot have intense spiritual yearning. It may be there, but superficial. So spiritual life becomes easier and the progress becomes faster when uh, it, is, it becomes intense. So intensity reduces the time required for making spiritual progress. A man can see God if he unites in himself the force of three attractions. The attraction of worldly possessions for the worldly man, the husband's attraction for the chief's wife, and the child's attraction for his mother. If you can unite these three forms of love and give it all to God, then you can see him once. 
So it is a kind of sublimation of worldly attractions. That's why there is one school of uh, devotion philosophy which teaches us that all human relationships can be given a spiritual orientation and that helps us in, pro in spiritual progress. All human relationships. Here Sri Ramakrishna gives three examples. Uh, the attraction and love between husband and wife, child's attraction for the mother, and also uh, I mean the attraction of worldly possessions for the worldly minded person. A very greedy man who uh, do everything for making money. That greed, giving an example, that greed can be turned into devotion to God. It's not easy, of course. Such people normally need a lot of blows <laughs> and then they, it becomes. That's why in one context he said, uh, if God wants to show grace to us, you, he, remove, he removes all the obstacles from your path. For a greedy man, what happens? God will take away all his possessions. His share markets will collapse, his bank, bank deposit will be lost, and practically he will become a pauper. If he is trying to be a very popular person mm -hmm. without caring for spiritual ideas, then God will make him totally, he will totally isolate him from his followers and relatives. So there is a famous verse in the one spiritual classic. Yesi anugraha michami tasya vittam karameham bandhavaisa viyogena brisham brisham bhavadi dukkitaha tena dukkhena samtrupto idivamna parityaje tam prasadam karishyami yad devai rapi sudurnatham. This is the verse. The translation is very simple. God tells that these words are put in the mouth of God. God tells. If he wants to show his grace to somebody, he may have done a lot of spiritual practices in previous life, but in this life he becomes extremely greedy. So God is very much concerned. He wants to show his mercy. So what he does, he turns into a pauper. Literally means I will steal all his money from him. Turn him into a pauper. Because even an extremely greedy man suddenly wakes up one day and finds the newspapers, all the banks have collapsed, all the stock markets have collapsed, he has lost all the money. He may take, turn to God. If he had accumulated some spiritual tendencies and impressions in previous life, it depends upon his accumulated tendencies and impressions and some skaras. If he had not done anything, he may take to drugs or alcohol, liquor, that's all. Otherwise, if such a person had done a lot of spiritual practices in previous life, had meditated, had read holy books, had gone to churches or temples or synagogues, had discussion with, with holy men and women, have accumulated some spiritual tendencies in his mind. And if that person happens to be born to be a very greedy person, that God wants to show his mercy. He doesn't want to leave him in this, in this forest of worldliness. If he has got a soft corner for him, because otherwise you let him enjoy, let him go. He'll give him free robe. Otherwise, if God wants to show his mercy, then what happens? He will create such a situation in his life that he will be forced to turn to God. That's why tragedies and unfortunate and happy events should be look, looked upon as an act of, as a sign of God, God's grace. This idea you find in many of the uh, medieval Christian uh, mystics and also in the great uh, devotional classics of 
ವೇದಾಂಟ ಹಿಂದೂಯಿಸಮ್ ಲೈಕ್ ನಾರದ ಭಕ್ತಿ ಸೂತ್ರ ಶಾಂಡಿಲ್ಯ ಸೂಕ್ತ ಭಾಗವತ ಪುರಾಣ ಮಹಾಭಾರತ ಆಲ್ ದೀಸ್ ಕ್ಲಾಸಿಕ್ಸ್ ಆರ್ ಫುಲ್ ಆಫ್ ಗ್ರೇಟ್ ಡಿವೋಟೀಸ್ ಹೂಮ್ ಗಾಡ್ ಸೇವ್ಡ್ ಬೈ ಕ್ರಿಯೇಟಿಂಗ್ ಎ ಸಿಚುವೇಶನ್ ಇನ್ ಡೇರ್ ಲೈಫ್ ದೆಟ್ ದೇ ವರ್ ಫೋರ್ಸ್ ಟು ಟರ್ನ್ ಟು ಗಾಡ್ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿ ಮೆರಿಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಅಕ್ಯುಮುಲೇಟೆಡ್ ಟೆಂಡೆನ್ಸೀಸ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಇಂಪ್ರೆಷನ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ಸ್ಟೆಡ್ ಆಫ್ ಟರ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಟುವರ್ಸ್ ರಾಂಗ್ ಡಿರೆಕ್ಷನ್ಸ್ they turned their attention to a spiritual ideas and they become completely isolated people sometimes forget spiritual ideas when they had lot of flatterers and followers around mm. so bandhavaisar yoga nam prasam bhavati dukkhita so they are completely isolated from their friends and flatterers and seeker fans so that they will realize when god is only real friend so this is fine one important example in fact there is an interesting episode a story in the famous devotional classic of bhagavata purana it is one of the most famous stories in this text it is called ajamilo bakhyanam the story of a great devotee who later had a deviation from his spiritual life his his name was ajamilo this man was born in a pious family and as a boy till he reached his 16th year he was he had a very good upbringing he was brought up as a pious god fearing spiritual aspirant could you say that name again ajamila a j a m i l a right thank you so much yes if i did it, do you find the bhagavata purana is so he was born in a pious family because he had done a lot of spiritual practices in previous life so he was born in a pious family uh up to 16th year he had a good upbringing but then when he became a young man he had a deviation this often happens because our character is a bundle of conflicting tendencies and impressions that's why sometimes we feel terrible conflict because our character as i said is a bundle there are many tendencies which are extremely helpful and positive mm-hmm. helpful in spiritual life there are some unfortunate undesirable tendencies which may not be so very helpful mm-hmm. so they come to the surface immediately oh what's the use of attending retreat everything let us go to las vegas so <laughs> but then after some time they may you may lose a lot of money then we should better concentrate so so mind is full of very positive very helpful tendencies and many undesirable and pleasant tendencies that's why you will be surprised according to many psychiatrists schizophrenia multiple personality and this many of the personality split problems are analyzed in the light of uh, previous life and conflicting tendencies and impressions created by actions in previous life there is this a view may be not acceptable to mainstream psychologist and psychiatrist but there are many psychiatrists who share this view anyway this man when he reached the maturity of his youth he had a complete deviation and he led a very loose life he became old and by the time he had practically then all possible sinful deeds that one could do in one's life <laughs> but he had one son his son's name was narayana narayana is a synonym of lord vishnu who happened to be the deity whom he was worshiping and meditating upon when he was small so uh, it it is one of the synonyms of god so to speak among the vaishnavites so when he was about to pass away he was he was able to breathe his last so when your senses are weak the mind is totally weak your natural tendencies and impressions that you gathered in the mind will come to the surface mm-hmm. see in in modern life 
you may have a lot of problems, still you can smile. Diplomats do that, mm -hmm. hotel receptionists do that, sales executives do that. Mm -hmm. So the whatever pro problems you may have, you are able to hide. But when the mind and senses are completely helpless, in a helpless condition, mm -hmm. on, the, on the point of death, natural tendencies in the mind come to the surface. So this man tried to remember his son's name, not God's name. By sheer accident, both happened to be the same. So he called his son to come to his side. And, but suddenly he remembered that same name he was, ch he was chanting, he was reciting as part of his spiritual practice during his younger days. That is, the, that is the name of Vishnu, one of the uh, Hindu trinities. So when he uttered his son's name, the thought of God also accidentally surfaced in his mind. Mm. And it is said, of course, it's a mythological story with a great spiritual message behind. When he was able to breathe his last, uh, the angels, the servants of Lord of Death came to claim his soul. But when he uttered the name of Narayana, then the angels also came there to claim his soul. They wanted to take him to heaven. The others wanted to take him to hell because of his sinful deeds, misdeeds. Then there's a dialogue among them. That's a mythological story. He says, the point is this, the trust, the main, the central theme of the dialogue is anybody who has done some spiritual practices and who remembers that and if he remembers that at the end of his life that will save him, that is the message. So that means attraction even for his son, it's not a spiritual attraction just worldly attachment, nothing wrong with that, but it's a worldly attachment, not a spiritual practice. Even that saved him, that suddenly brought in his mind the memories of his own early childhood, when he was, when he used to meditate reciting this holy name. So Sri Ramakrishna says, any kind of sublimation of even worldly attachments can become a great spiritual attraction and becomes a great help in spiritual life. That's why there is a school of devotional philosophy, which is Navadha Bhakti, nine types, ninefold path of devotion. You hear about God, you sing about God, you remember God's name, and you consider yourself to be God's servant, his friend, or his benefactor, whatever may be, Sravanam, Girtanam, Vishnu, Smaranam, Padasevanam, Achanam, Vandanam, Dasim, Sakhim, Atmani, Vedanam. So nine parts. The highest one is surrendering oneself to God. But it, can, it cannot be done all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. So give a spiritual God word, uh, the orientation to our mind and all the five senses of perception. So whenever we, whenever it's possible, whenever it's convenient to us, try to somehow accumulate positive, spiritually helpful, spiritually healthy tendencies and impressions by chanting, by singing, by reading, by listening, uh, by ritualistic worship, or just sitting in contemplation on higher spiritual ideas. All these are different ways of enriching our mind with spiritual thoughts. That is a great help in spiritual life. Mm. If a devotee prays to God with real longing, God cannot help revealing himself to him. So looking upon God as one's mother or father or a great friend who won't desert you. 
All these are different parts. The other day, I told you the meaning of bhakti. It is to adore God with body, mind and words. With body means to serve and worship God with one's hands and go to holy places with one's feet. Hear the chanting of the name and glories of God with one's ears and behold the divine image with one's eyes. See, as I said, you know, give a God word a spiritual orientation to whatever we see, we hear, we listen to, we do, whatever, we think, everything. It may not be always possible at the beginning, but Siddharmushna gives a psychological clue when it's develop an intense yearning, intense desire. So, just as there is a sublimation of uh, the senses, there is such a thing, a sublimation of desires. All people have desires. Everyone. Everyone is interested as desire for something or other. So, we should be able to sublimate the focus, the object of desire. It's called yearning and make, make it as intense as possible. So when it becomes intense, when it attains more and more intensity, then spiritual progress becomes easier. It is, it is psychologically, you can very easily understand. When we are interested in something, we forget everything. See people who are interested in the 49ers and football and all this. They rush to the TV computer at that point. Now, that means they forget everything else. So everyone has got one focus of interest, mm -hmm. desire, no doubt about it. There is nobody in the world who is not interested, who doesn't have any desire for anything, <laughs> except the spiritually most enlightened person. Every normal human being has some interest, some desire for something or other. <laughs> The desire or interest may be for worldly attainments, worldly achievements. So, often we say, well, I don't get time to, to do spiritual practices. Means, I do get a lot of time for many other things. So, here Sri Ramakrishna says, we should develop a strong desire, yearning, the intense, deep-rooted, dynamic desire, intense desire for spiritual practices. <clears throat> so, the other day I told you the meaning of bhakti. It is to adore God with body, mind and words. With body means to serve and worship God with one's hands. Go to, go to holy places with one's feet. Hear the chanting of name and glories of God with one's ears. And behold, the divine image with one's eyes. With mind means to contemplate and meditate on God. So all mind, all the five senses of perception, eyes, ears, everything can be given a spiritual orientation. Then it becomes a real yearning, earnest uh, devotion for God. Devotion as described by Narada is suited to the Kali Yuga. It means to chant constantly the name of glories of God. Let those who have no leisure worship God at least morning and evening by wholeheartedly chanting His name and clapping their hands. It's a very simple instruction, chanting the name of God. Because, uh, you know, it is very simple. It is a very gross act. We often have a wrong notion that Advaita is the only path and the most desirable thing. There is no doubt about it that Advaitic experience is the highest experience. So, in fact, Sri Ramakrishna himself says that at the experience level, there is no conflict between non-dualistic philosophy and the highest devotion. The highest bhakti or devotion and the highest jnana or spiritual knowledge are the same at the experience level. Shankaracharya himself writes in a commentary on the Bhagavad Gita verse is that Maicha Anenne Yogena Bhakti Ra Vibhijarini Vivikta Desha Sevitum Anabhijana Samsadi It's a famous verse maybe the 13th chapter of the Gita who, 
who is the highest devotee what is the state of highest devotion the highest devotion is unwavering devotion pure unchanging completely focused and concentrated achala shuddha like that shankar abhijarini bhakti pure devotion now and shankaracharya says sacha gnanam that highest devotion is gnanam also so at the experience level the highest devotion and the highest gnanam non dualistic experience are the same but we have to remember we have to start somewhere we cannot start with the university we have to start with the kindergarten mm-hmm. and starting kindergarten means first we have to divert the focus of mind from external objects towards a spiritual focus spiritual <coughs> object now mind is being dragged into different external sensory objects distracted towards various objects this mind has to be withdrawn and turned towards a spiritual focus how is it possible how to do that first we must start with some external rituals that may be partly physical to begin with so chanting the name of god everyone can do at the beginning you may not be able to do that with great concentration at the beginning it may even be just mechanical that is not enough but then that is a beginning we have to start with the primary school with the kindergarten <clears throat> so chanting the name of god is possible even for the for the grossest mind of people because that fills the mind with a with a with a not net point of focus we counteracts the mind's normal tendency to be distracted towards external objects and slowly one can progress this chanting this recitation of the holy name becomes more and more subtle more and more intense more and more spiritual this is how one evolves in the path of spiritual life and sri ramakrishna makes a point in modern times our natural power of concentration is limited even the convenient conducive environment for spiritual practices is also limited so under these circumstances one can take the name of god mentally even while being engaged in different secular duties and responsibilities so that that should be the beginning of spiritual life that's what sri ramakrishna says the ego of a devotee begets no pride we discuss this point the ego of a devotee so to start spiritual life we need a strong determination self effort as we said at the beginning self effort is not possible without some self confidence which again related to the ego idea so here ego gets a promotion normally ego is aggressive assertion of our individuality the exclusion of every other individuality that's what ego means we assert our individual entity more or less at a psycho physical level i am this is my name these are my things i and mine so we identify ourselves with this psycho physical mechanism then we identify our identify all that belongs to the psycho physical mechanism this is the grossest dimension of ego now sridhar krishna says this ego can be given a spiritual promotion so you if you if you are so egoistic you be well i am i am proud because i am a servant of god i am a devotee it is certainly not the highest stage but it is certainly a very good beginning it is called the sublimation of the ego so as sridhar krishna says the ego of a devotee begets no pride it is not an aggressive assertion it is an attempt to practice spiritual sadhana it does not create ignorance on the contrary it helps one realize god 
In fact, sublimated ego helps you to go beyond ego. Mm. Unsublimated, unrefined ego uh, is like a uh, like a iron chain, a shackle that binds us. On the other hand, sublimated ego is a door that opens to liberation, freedom. Mm. It helps us to go beyond ego to transcend ego. Mm. This ego is no more like the ordinary ego than hints is like ordinary greens. One generally becomes indisposed by eating greens. So something from normal human life situations, you know. But hinche removes excessive bile. So that means the greens normally create stomach problems, but this particular substance helps you to remove these problems. It does one good. Sugar candy is not like ordinary sweets. Sweets are generally harmful, but sugar candy removes acidity. That's Sri Ramakrishna. See, this, my, mind you, they were, Sri Ramakrishna was living in the 19th century. So in those days, when modern medicine had not developed, they had many such uh, wonderful ideas, which were mostly derived from Ayurveda, indigenous schools of medicine, which they used to apply with great benefits. So, having a spiritual ego is like eating sugar candy. <laughs> having normal, unspiritual ego is like eating maybe ex with dangerous <laughs> cholesterol full of sweets, you know, which can straight away take you to Kaiser. <laughs> like that. So, then Nishtha leads to Bhakti. Nishtha means the well. One uh, strong uh, identification with one's own chosen spiritual idea and spiritual path. It doesn't lead to fanaticism, it should not lead to fanaticism, but one should identify oneself with one's own chosen path and chosen idea. Because that creates uh, a very conducive environment and also it reduces conflicts and distractions and helps in concentration and focusing our mind on the spiritual idea. Bhakti or devotion when mature becomes bhava, Bhava, when concentrated, becomes Mahabhava. Last of all is Prema. These are different levels of ecstatic experiences in the evolution of devotion. First, we begin with Bhava. Then it becomes more intense. And finally, uh, it culminates in Prema. Mm -hmm. So, when you reach that stage, Guru Maharaj says, Sri Ramakrishna says, by prema God is bound to the devotee. He can no longer run away. So at one particular stage, God feels a blind to help his devotee. And whenever there is an obstacle, God may remove those obstacles. But from a secular point of view, from the spiritual aspirant's point of view, it may appear to be a setback in spiritual life. Mm -hmm. But actually God is removing you from the wrong path or removing a big boulder, a big stone that is lying on your path or filling up a pit that's there in front of you. That's what is happening. Sometimes this is a, this gives a glue, clue to some of the uh, inexplicable, indescribable, mysterious things that happen in the life of spiritual seekers. See, look at Yam himself. So one of the most classic examples, an extremely well-educated man. Among the various devotees and admirers and visitors who came to Sri Ramakrishna, there were many who were highly placed of government officials, very influential, very wealthy. And they were, many of them were far inferior to young Mahendra Gupta in education, in scholarship, uh, and the fa abilities, faculties. But Yam could not get a very good job. And now, suppose Yam had a very good job and very wealthy man, but possibly he would not have come to Sri Ramakrishna. So in his case, such a well-established, such a well-educated man, so influential, highly respected, he had an, an unfortunate family life. 
But if you ask, if you had asked him at that time or his family people, they would have worried. But then, when you look back, mm -hmm. you find that it was the beginning of a new chapter in Yem's life. It was actually a transition point, a point from where he began a new chapter in his life. His spiritual life began at that point. Oh, look at Swami Vivekananda. Well, I w if you will agree with me, Swami Vivekananda was arguably the most gifted and one of the best educated young men in Calcutta city at that time. He could not get a very good job. There were so many of Sri Ramakrishna's admirers and visitors. Very wealthy and they, were, they had reached very high levels in government bureaucracy. But Swami Vivekananda was going from place to place in search of a job because his family was in dire financial needs. What he wanted was a job so that he could support his family. Now just imagine how do you, uh, how do you uh, explain this uh, conundrum, this inexplicable mystery. You find the lives of many great spiritual personalities. From one angle, they were extremely gifted, but in, from a worldly point of view, they could not make both ends meet, or they could not succeed as much as many lesser men and women would have succeeded. Mm. So these, uh, uh, what do you call, setbacks or unhappy episodes uh, were instrumental in their turning uh, to a spiritual life. Not that they did cause them to learn to spiritual life. Everybody, people who are under identical circumstances do not turn to spiritual life all the time. But what I mean, this is a great, this should be a great consolation for many spiritual seekers. Mm -hmm. I mean, unfortunate or unhappy events should not make us depressed. For sincere spiritual seekers, this is uh, this inevitable. See, spiritual life is like entering a stream, a river, and trying to swim against the current. Worldly life is swimming in, in the same direction in which current is flowing. If we move in, if we swim in the same direction, helped by the current, assisted by the force of the current, everything is easy. But the moment you start swimming against the current, first you have to face the pressure of the current. So a lot of effort is needed even to keep status quo. Otherwise you will be pushed in the opposite direction. So every spiritual seeker is like a swimmer who enters the river trying to swim against the current. And in such situations, setbacks are inevitable. Setbacks show that we are in the right direction. In fact, to explain this phenomenon, as I said in, the, in one of the well-known Puranas, uh, the Lord makes this statement. I did not explain the latter part of this verse. The latter part says this. In spite of all the setbacks and difficulties, if the devotee doesn't desert me, if he continues in his spiritual life, continues practicing spiritual sadhanas, doing spiritual practices, then I will elevate him into such a position that it will be an envy for even the angels. Even the angels will be jealous of him to such a high position, I will elevate him, whom the devotee, who in spite of setbacks and difficulties and tragedies, doesn't desert me, but continues practicing spiritual sadhana. That is the ultimate gift I am going to give to him or to her. That's a great promise. Now we will have interaction. We'll continue the discussion next day. <coughs> Swami.
That last verse you quoted, where is that from? Uh, that verse, we do not know. It is quoted by Ramanuja, but it is not found in in some of the well-known devotional classics like Bhagavad Purana. It is quoted by many devotional philosophers. I mean, to explain God's grace and uh, this inexplicable mystery of an all-merciful God and incompatibility with a cruel world. How do you explain this incompatibility between a mm. merciful God and a cruel world? Mm. So, a cruel world is not totally inexplicable. For spiritual seekers, it is the it is the green signal you are going you are on the right track. <laughs> That's the meaning. You find these ideas in many of the writings, in and some of the monologues, uh, in Philophilokelia, Brother Lawrence, somebody wrote, "Now God, you are trying to tempt me." All right. <laughs> of course, they are always bringing Satan. If you remove that, many of these ideas you find in the mystical writings. So. Is, uh, medieval mystics. Mm -hmm. Mostly you find in the Russian Orthodox writers. writers. Well, I, mean, I was thinking about some of the great Christian mystics like Jakob Burma. Yeah. Uh, he um, uh, had this deep inspired vision and there was this man named Richter who just took a dislike to Burma and he attacked him and this went on for years and years and he drove Burma out of his town and um, just wanted to almost kill him but Burma kept going and the same with Eckhart he he yes. ran into authorities yes. who wanted to do him in and they were gonna send him up you know before the Inquisition and then he passed away but, you he know, vanished, I, we don't know what happened to him. So many of, you know, of these great lives, yes. you see this, yes. a yes. tremendous opposition to what they're doing, and they have to face unspeakable uh, difficulties. And it increases their faith, as you say, yes. and uh, deepens their, their spirituality. So. Once they get a glimpse of real spiritual experience, then they also get the strength to look upon all this as and look upon this and take them in their stride. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. For, for common people, they will be surprised. I tell you one interesting question somebody put to me. In the Mahabharata, there are five brothers, the Pandava brothers. They were the embodiments of dharma, morality, ethics. And there were uh, more than hundred brothers on the other side, all wicked villains, you know. Now, th these wicked villains, the Kauravas, they had, they had enjoyed worldly life, they had four square meals every day, they lived in palatial buildings, and these Pandavas were mostly living in the forests, <laughs> hunting the animals. And they had very miserable life, miserable from a worldly point of view. But they had the strong faith and devotion to Lord Krishna. So that faith, that devotion, gave them a different outlook on life. Mm -hmm. So what we normally interpret as miseries, in a worldly sense, are not miseries for the saint, for the spiritual pilgrim. Mm -hmm. They consider these are inevitable, necessary impediments, so they can take them into a stride. Mm -hmm. So there is this difference in approach and attitude. Mm -hmm. So these pe people ask this question, many modern agnostics ask this question. If God is so merciful, why should there be so many problems in this world? How it, this incompatibility between an all merciful God and a, a miserable world? Why should there? Why we, God can give food to everyone? Mm -hmm. uh, God can give education to everyone, social security, uh, health care for everyone. Uh, you know, you, you know that Grand Inquisitor episode. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in fact, the Grand Inquisitor, the Cardinal puts a question to Jesus who was brought before him. Look here. That Satan tempted you three times. Why don't you turn all these uh, stones into loaves of bread? Then people have plenty to eat. But Jesus didn't do that. So Jesus wanted people to turn to spiritual life of their own. 
without with not as slaves but as free men and women otherwise it won't lead to liberation of course i don't want to go further into that grand inquisitorial episode but it's an important point so for the spiritual seeker these setbacks are not really setbacks but for from a worldly point of view they may appear to be tragedies which are really not tragedies for them and for their perspective so that's it. So, um, th this is a, a problem that I have, and I haven't been able to solve it yet. Now, you say that um, you have spiritual experience of some kind, then faith comes. And... Uh, then you you know these some of these great swamis who have come to this country and built up a center. And uh, one time uh, a devotee asked one of these great swamis, "Why is everything so hard for you?" And he said, "Well, Sri Ramakrishna wasn't easy on Holy Mother and Swamiji." So he had achieved a real faith that what was happening to him was uh, coming from the divine. And he was growing spiritually in the process. Now an ordinary devotee may have glimpses of the divine and uh, have faith that God exists. But uh, how can this ordinary devotee have the faith that God is interested in him? Mm -hmm. That's my problem. Well, at the initial stage, there is a period, a dark night of the soul, as something called, that we have to go through. Every spiritual seeker has yeah. to go through. Yeah. Once that is over, then problems are no more problems. As I said earlier, to enjoy the wind that is blowing, you should reach the midstream. That involves some effort. You have to untie the boat for the anchor, you have to row, you have to reach the midstream. Then you will be able to feel and enjoy the wind that is blowing. So. That effort and the period of reaching midstream is a stage, a period which even even world teachers had to go through. Mm -hmm. Look at Swami Vivekananda himself, Sri Ramakrishna, all the great world teachers, Jesus, Jesus, Buddha, all of them. So there is a particular period which they all go through. It is sometimes interpreted that they want to demonstrate, give a demonstration before the world. They, they are, if they are especially privileged persons who are, for whom everything is easy, then people won't turn to spiritual life. We have problems, they have no problem. Mm -hmm. So why work? How can we expect to reach that goal? So every great spiritual teacher demonstrates this reality. So they also go through the same period of initial conflicts, there is always a period when you have started believing, you know there is something other than the secular worldly comforts. Otherwise you won't turn to spiritual life. You are fully convinced. Otherwise you, won't, you can't bring your mind to, med to practice meditation or prayer. Because nothing tangible is available, nothing visible. So you have to put your faith on something which is now invisible. But you know it exists. Mm -hmm. Otherwise you cannot start meditation and prayer or any effort. But it does not become obvious to you. This is the period of trial which every spiritual seeker, including great world teachers, have to go through. And during that time, uh, many things could be of great help reading scriptures, discussion, 
and constant remembrance. Along with that, we may have doubts. Many people may have deviations. But again, whatever you have done will not be lost. That will come to your rescue. Again, we will re-engage in spiritual practices. It's a period of uh, there's a period that everyone has to go through. Unless people have a little bit of experience, they won't take the trouble to uh, cancel their ob obligations and spend nine days in <laughs> Lake Tahoe. Just imagine. <laughs> Practically, you are not going to get anything. No promotion, nothing uh, in terms of secular achievement. So you, even to be able to enjoy peace of mind, listening to spiritual ideas, you must have some experience. The peace of mind, the tranquility, the feeling that there is something precious in these teachings, that requires a little bit of experience, which is not worldly experience, which is certainly spiritual. Otherwise nobody can continue in this path. causing the obstacles and to see it truly as something that needs to be worked on for your progress versus something that's just ordinary life stuff. Well, in devotional life, we need not really worry about the possible borders or obstacles in our path. Mm -hmm. We must concentrate on, on our own spiritual practices. Then you find many obstacles have vanished. You look back, you find mm -hmm. at many obstacles which by the grace of God have vanished. Mm -hmm. uh, for a devotee, he doesn't just uh, clearly see an obstacle before him or her and then uh, avoid it. A devotee continuously practices prayers, meditation and so on. And then you find, uh, when you look back, suddenly you find, oh, Somebody, some invisible power has removed some obstacles from my path. That's what really happens in the life of devotees. Of course, there are some other visible obstacles. See, that uh, two instructions are given. Anugulisya sangalpaka pradigulisya varjanam. That means, we must go on reinforcing enriching our mind with positive thoughts, positive tendencies, positive aspirations, positive, through positive spiritual practices, holy associations, discussions, continued effort. And also avoiding negative, negative ideas, negative associations, negative thought currents, which may weaken our faith and may distract the mind, create distractions for the mind. So these two obstacles, sorry, these two instructions are given uh, as the first two steps uh, in spiritual life. Reinforcing the mind with positive tendencies by uh, engaging spiritual practices with concentration. At the same time, constantly trying to avoid all opposite tendencies and impressions, associations activities and so on. This is a great, that's a discrimination is necessary. Yesterday we discussed this point. Devotion to God and then friendly feelings towards fellow spiritual as seekers, devotees, compassion for those who are interested in spiritual life and total indifference, keeping a long distance from people who may take us away from our spiritual path. Swamiji uses uh, uh, the same word three times. Interesting. Indifference, indifference, indifference. Yesterday I quoted this. Mm -hmm. That is very important. Mm -hmm. We should not go near them and try to convert them. They will convert you. <laughs> and we should not antagonize them either. That also <laughs> will establish a contact with the negative right. tendencies and impressions. That also equally harmful. Mm -hmm. 
So aversion and attraction both are equally harmful. Any kind of interaction with negative tendencies and impressions and associations could be harmful. So indifference. Mm. Swami, Swami Yatishwarananda in the famous book Meditation and Spiritual Practice, he recommends a kind of spiritual filtering mechanism, a mental filtering mechanism. If you can develop an instinctive faculty to filter out all undesirable thought currents and associations, and to observe all positive, helpful thought currents. This is, a, this is a great help in spiritual life. That Swami Yatishwarananda uh, gave this answer to one of the questioners. He was giving lectures uh, in European countries that time, before the Second World War, perhaps. Swami, in the case though where you said sometimes people through these obstacles will take the higher road and some will not. So that seems like it says not really, but sort of predetermined about what's already going on within you that you recognize, whether it's conscious or unconscious, the fact that you will go one road rather than the other. Uh, you, may, you may feel like you have reached a junction with four lines, four directions, four... It's like with the Amman's Swanaji, that who, because of life circumstances, their, I don't call it karma, took them one way. Well, but in, in, you see, then you find Swamiji's life, when we read, even when he was a child, during his early days, he, he was born with a strong spiritual aspiration. What about ordinary people? In, excuse me? More ordinary people. These are these ordinary people. people. Yeah. Yes, in the case of ordinary people, uh, sometimes obstacles may take them in the opposite direction. But uh, gradually, at one stage or other, the strong accumulated positive tendencies will certainly resurface. It will come. That's why pe that's why they have these conflicting tendencies. Uh, sometimes we feel great enthusiasm to practice, to do spiritual practices. Sometimes we feel a kind of depression or we mean doubts and waverings. So uh, all great spiritual teachers give a strong warning against the latter phenomenon. At that time, we must persist and continuously practice. If we can't meditate, we can chant the name of God. If we can't do that, read books, listen. Mm -hmm. So after all, reading is comparatively a gross act, uh, much more physical than meditation, which we can do easily. If we can't read, we can sit in chair, listen to some spiritual lectures or hymns or more mm -hmm. music. And great. Yeah. So there are different ways of uh, associating the mind with spiritual ideas, not necessarily through meditation at all. Any, any, any method that helps us to enrich the mind with spiritual ideas is helpful. So Swami, I'm not sure if I've got this right, but it seems like, so we run into an obstacle, we feel thwarted or overwhelmed or, or lethargic and and then if we can see that as an opportunity as part of the moral gymnasium that Swamiji talked about then that just even being able to see that yeah. shows some grace yes yes then that's like a baby step that gives us a, a little oomph to have some self-effort to work on that, yes, yes. which it, it, kind of, it seems like it's just sort of a, a little slow dance forward that we're doing here. Self-effort and challenge and grace, yes, yes. and it, it just hopefully gets easier at this point. Yes, but we should be careful, <laughs> we should be careful uh, to avoid making logical analysis of what is happening in our mind, mm -hmm. what is happening. Next we must keep concentrating on our own regular spiritual practices. So if we can't meditate, we can read. If we can't read, we can listen. If still that we can't do that, we can do something, some kind of a work, thinking that is God's work. So uh, trying to remain engaged in some kind of spiritual activity 
should be our main goal. We should be very careful uh, to avoid making analysis, logical analysis of is an obstacle or should I do? Is the, something is happening? But because that creates a lot of distraction. That's why logical analysis becomes a great source of worry and distraction for the devotee, mm -hmm. for, for the spiritual seeker in daily life. He should concentrate on positively moving in his own direction. It is possible. See, if we cannot meditate, because that's a very subtle, abstract spiritual practice, we can read. We cannot read, we can write. If still we can sit and listen, Still, if we can't do that, we can do some, do some karma yoga or any kind of activity, a selfless activity. All this will be helpful. Mm -hmm. The Gita, uh, if you read, try to remember, read this verse, the twelfth chapter, it's called Bhakti Yoga. There are four levels of spiritual practice, devotional practice mentioned. From 8th verse to 11th verse. 8th, 9th, 10th and 11th. So from in a descending order, Lord Krishna gives four alternate steps. In the 8th verse, he says, Mayeva mana adatsu, may buddhim nivesya, nivasi shesi mayeva adavutana samsiya. The verse means this. See, try to keep your mind and intellect always focused and concentrate on God. Then, you live on me, and I shall live in you. But it's the highest goal. In a descending order, he gives an alternate. If you can't do that, try to remember, try to read, try to uh, sing devotional hymns, try to uh, somehow associate with spiritual ideas. Then again he says, if you can't do that, then for the convenience of those who are interested, the ninth verse, he says, Atha chittam samadhadu pune shaknoshi mai sthiram abhyasa yogena tato mami chaptam dhananjaya. Which means, if you can't focus your mind on God, on me, well, try to do that by constant practice. As I said, listening, reading, uh, concentrate, uh, uh, worshipping, <coughs> all this, whatever you do, give, try to give a spiritual orientation uh, to your mind by uh, diverting all the five senses towards a spiritual channel. But this is also not easy. Apyase pya samartho si mad karma paramo bhava madatham abhi karmani kurvan siddhi mava. If this is also not possible, well, do your duty. But think within your mind, it is my work. Everyone can do. In fact, we all do that. Most devotees do that. They do that. It's God's work. Everyone can do. We, we may be working in the factory, we may be working in the monastery, convent, office, university, hospital, wherever may be. It is God's work. Because that idea uh, brings the idea of God, God's association to our mind. Slowly mind gets a spiritual orientation. Finally, in the 11th verse, the 12th chapter, Lord Krishna says, Atha etadabhi ashaktosi kartum madhyoga masidaha sarva karma phalatyagam tata kuriyatatma Still, if you can't do that, if you cannot do things thinking it's my work, God's work, then you do whatever you consider to be your duty, your responsibility, but mentally try to surrender the results of your actions and your action to God. Now, this is possible for everyone. A, in a descending order, uh, the teacher of Bhagavad Gita gives four steps. So if you, I, I should give you a, a graphic description, the ascending order. To begin with, do your duty the office, the factory, wherever it is. But mentally surrender its fruits to God. And if you practice this for some time, then slowly you will be able to practice. But whatever I am doing is God's work. Because 
The result of what I am doing, I am surrendering to God. So it is God's work. And this will slowly help you to remember God all the time in your mind. And then finally, slowly you find you will start living in God. And God will start living in you. Mean all constant remembrance. So, those of you who are interested can remember these four verses. Eight to eleventh verse. In a descending order. But you can start practicing in an ascending order. From 11th verse, then 10th, then 9th, then 8th. In fact, this is what, uh, what all spiritual seekers try to do. If you look at the uh, history of spiritual practices in all religions, first they try to do well, it's God's work. I'm, it's your, I'm offering this to you. And then it's your work. So, once you associate God's name with whatever you do, slowly mind gets associated with God. And slowly you find, uh, you, you, at the most advanced stage, uh, the thought of God becomes a part of our nature. Spiritual thought becomes part of our nature. Mm. So, the, it is taught in the Gita. So, I think we have we have reached our time. <coughs> Om Tavagatha Murdam Tapta Jeevanam Kabibhiriditam Karma Shabhakam Sravanam Gadam Simata Dutam Bhuvik Udanthi Bhurita Jana